know. And yes, yes, we can, we can do this. Uh, I, I, I called the weekend, uh, of course, time travel way back before uh, I thought we, we would end up uh, virtual. And uh, I think it was an appropriate, uh, an appropriate title for the, uh, for the weekend. Uh, and yes, we uh, will be time traveling and we'll be trying, you know, time traveling a lot. Uh, you know, the accordion that we all know and love, which is why we're here to begin with, uh, you know, takes us everywhere. And uh, it, it basically cuts through spheres. It transcends time and space. Uh, it takes us in the various dimensions. And that's pretty much the accordion that we, that we play. Uh, as you may know, the accordion has been invented probably thousands of times. Uh, there is this linear idea that the accordion started somewhere in the second century BC and then worked its way up to the uh, uh, portative organ and things of that nature. And then some guy named Damien came along and invented it somewhere in the 19th century. And uh, all of that is, is, is cool. Uh, but for me, uh, the accordion was invented in 1906 uh, when the Darrow brothers decided to take it, on, uh, take it into vaudeville. And, uh, and that's the kind of accordion I've been using all my life with, you know, the piano keyboard on top of it. And uh, not that I don't like the other, the other accordions, the other accordions I love, but in many of the countries, they, uh, certain accordions might have a certain DNA that's associated with that particular country. Uh, there, and there's thousands of them. Uh, I won't go into every one, I wish I could, but uh, I won't go into every single one. And there's also those other, other strange hybrids that, that uh, I can talk about briefly. And as a teacher, if I uh, didn't get one of these particular accordions for a lesson, I would probably miss teaching. Uh, I remember uh, one lady uh, bringing in an accordion. She wanted a lesson on it. And uh, I never saw this instrument in my life. Uh, and it was from Slovenia. And I've seen Slovenian accordions, but this was, uh, again, I've never seen anything like it. And the book she gave me was in Slovenian. And you had to start from the back page to the front page. And uh, she was Italian, spoke no English, and was a Chinese major at Columbia. So all I had this in front of me and I had to teach her the first lesson. Uh, and with between an hour, you know, an hour and a half went by, I was able to get her to play a scale. And uh, I mean, I can figure, th I can figure things like that uh, out. And so we were able to play a scale and I kind of dug the idea that uh, these instruments actually kind of existed, these incredible hybrids. And uh, I never saw this person again. It, uh, the next day was 9-11. And so uh, uh, whatever happened, happened. And then, you know, Will Holzhauser, uh, who I'm looking at right now, he told me when he was in Buenos Aires, Argentina, that he saw an accordion that was a right-hand piano keyboard and the left hand was a bandonian. Uh, one of these particular hybrids. Uh, then I had another student who came and uh, uh, it was a bandonian and the left hand had cores like a stradella system. Uh, and uh, I booked a second lesson with this, uh, with this gentleman and what happened is the accordion got, got caught in a fire. And so uh, he didn't have that instrument anymore. And, uh, and again, all these strange instruments take place. Now there are uh, meetings being held in various accordion association about standardizing the instrument. Now it's probably a good idea. 
Uh, but I'm not so sure it's my gig uh, because I probably would miss all the varieties of, of, of accordions that exist out there. And again, I'm totally in love with the instrument that I play, uh, the piano accordion, because it can float through dimensions. It can play anything. Uh, the DNA isn't stuck in any one particular kind of place. It can float around. And, and it seems to me that's part of the gigger's culture. And uh, the North American psyche, uh, uh, New York, seems to be centered around the gigger's culture. And that brings us to our first talk. I'm going to call upon Will Holshauser, and he's going to tell us about what it takes to survive in the music business, what you need to know, what you need to prepare for, and uh, using the uh, foundation, the New York scene. Without further ado, uh, my good friend, Will Holzhauser, ladies and gentlemen. Hi everyone, I'm Will Holzhauser and welcome to my talk on skills for working musicians with a special focus on accordionists. As a working musician, you have to wear a lot of different hats and navigate a lot of different ways of making music. These various working situations call for different skills and different kinds of preparation based on musical differences and also on unspoken assumptions and customs that are part of each musical genre. So I wanted to share some of this on the ground information with you from my own experience. I'm hoping that this will be useful to those of you who are working musicians and to those of you who aren't, I'm hoping it will be an interesting behind the scenes look into what we do. One example of an unspoken assumption is the idea of rehearsal time. In jazz and rock, when you say rehearsal starts at two o'clock, that usually means arrive at two o'clock, maybe five minutes before. Uh, the studios are often rented by the hour, so the room opens up, you set up, you unpack, you say hi to the other musicians, and then you start playing a few minutes later. But with classical music, rehearsal at two o'clock means the conductor is going to start rehearsing the music right at two o'clock. So you need to arrive 15 or 20 minutes early, unpack, find your place, and be in your seat and ready to play at two o'clock. Uh, there's nothing better or worse about either one, but they're just two different customs and no one tells you that when they call you for the rehearsal. So that's just an example of one unspoken assumption. So now let's look at four different kinds of music work and the different kinds of skills and preparation they each call for. Rock, pop, and singer-songwriter gigs can be a lot of fun. Often you're adding a new element to someone's music that is already very strong on its own. Very often with this kind of music, you won't get any written materials or you might just get a simple chord chart. So the recording is going to be your uh, most important reference. You will either learn your parts from the recording by ear or you'll be expected to come up with your own parts. Uh, sometimes there's no accordion on the original recording, sometimes there is. So one good way to practice is to play along with the recording, come up with a couple of different options because in rehearsal you might be asked to try something different. You want to have a couple of different approaches that you can offer for each tune. Uh, it also really helps to make your own notes. If you have to learn 8 to 12 songs for a gig and you have one or two rehearsals, it can be hard to memorize all that music. Then sometimes maybe you won't see that person for six months or a year and then you'll get called for another one and you have to remember what you did. So it can be very useful to make, make your own notes. Uh, here's an example of a chord chart that uh, someone sent me and a few quick notes that I made on it. The artist sent me just this typed up chart with the chords on it, which gives you the basic form, but I had to sketch in a few extra things to make it a little more precise. Then in rehearsal, I came up with a little riff to play during the introduction. So I wrote that quickly on the top of the chart. Uh, then where it says verse, you can see the two eighth notes. That's to remind me that I'm playing a 
part that involves chords chugging along in eighth notes. And again, these notes are just for myself to remind me what I did. Uh, and this is so this is an example of just adding a few quick things to a chord chart. Now, sometimes if you don't get any chord chart at all, all they send you is a recording, then you can still make your own notes. So this is an example of uh, some notes I made. The song begins with an accordion riff, a two bar riff. So then that repeats. And then I have some shorthand showing first chorus, first verse, second chorus, second verse, etc. And I just very quickly wrote in the parts that I came up with. Uh, so I could just pull it out and play it whenever, whenever I need to. And as you can see, there's one line that's crossed out. That's a change that we made in rehearsal. And then I very quickly wrote in the ending that we came up with in rehearsal. So if I didn't see her for six months or a year, I could just pull this out and I'd be ready to go. Here's another example of some notes I made for myself for a concert with Suzanne Vega. And in this case, the part that I'm playing is very minimal. It's just a few notes, but I have to be able to remember exactly what it is. So for this one, I decided it was easiest to just write the part out bar by bar all the way. And most of the time I'm at the beginning there, I'm tacit. and then where it says in at the end of the second line. That's where I come in with this very sparse part. Broadway in musical theater is a very different situation. You'll get a fully notated part with every note written out. If you're hired for your own chair in a show, that's great. You'll get to rehearse and maybe even help develop the part for your instrument. But right now I'm gonna focus on subbing, which is a very special situation. Subbing in musical theater can be pressurized because you don't get any rehearsal. You have to learn the part and then go in and do it. And the expectation is that the music will sound pretty much the same at every performance for the sake of the actors, singers, and the dancers. So what you get is the written part and a video of the conductor showing how each beat of the show is conducted. Once you learn the music, you practice along with that video and you get to know every last corner of it, every last beat. You might need to memorize certain spots to make sure you can keep your eye on the conductor or make a page turn, something like that. You might want to write in some extra information like whether or not you get a count off, how much time you have between numbers, certain lines the actors say or sing, or some extra cues from the other instruments. Uh, an important part of the process is to get together with the musician you're subbing for. They'll give you lots of nitty gritty information. Then you get a chance to watch from the pit. You can check out the sight lines, the sound, and the physical setup. Pits can be very cramped, so you want to make sure you can see the conductor. You want to make sure the chair is the right height for you, and uh, all those little details that can make you comfortable in a, in a pit. Now, sometimes accordion parts, especially, need a little streamlining. Here's an example of a page from the accordion part of an off-Broadway show. The arranger wrote beautiful orchestrations, but like a lot of arrangers, didn't have all the information about how to write for accordion. So as you can see, there's some pianistic moments in the left hand, and the person I was subbing for just crossed these out and was collaborating with the music director of the show to make the accordion part work. So as you can see, leaving out some of the information makes the part more focused and stronger. This is a case where less is definitely more. In classical music, as with many music genres, there's no standard role for the accordion and there's no standard place for the accordionist to sit in the orchestra. So when you get to the rehearsal, they might have no idea where to put you. Depending on the music, it's good to be near the instruments you have to connect with. If you're more of a soloist in the music, you might be up front. But in any case, if your seat isn't working, if you're getting blasted by the brass, or if you can't see the conductor, you can always ask to be moved. Obviously, learn the part well, practice until it feels comfortable, be able to vary the tempo and the dynamics, listen to at least one recording of the piece. If it's a new piece or a premiere, you can ask if the composer has a computer demo. That can be useful. And it's also good to ask for a copy of the score. That way you can write in extra cues that might be helpful for keeping track of where you are. And you can see what is going on. Who are you doubling with? Who do you need to listen to for articulations and dynamics and so forth? One time I found a mistake in a part by comparing it with the score. This is Hindemith Kammermusik number one. 
the second system from the bottom, there were a couple of missing accidentals in the left hand, the G sharp and the D sharp. But also here on this page, I wrote in some extra cues. I wrote in a bunch of notes about dynamics and how to, how to really match with the other instruments. Jazz also has no standard role for the accordion. And of course, there are many different kinds of jazz. Each band leader or each group might call for something different. And the process is often somewhat collaborative. So think about why you're there. Are you a bridge to a certain kind of world music? Are you adding something completely new? Uh, are you providing chords? Are you playing a line in a special arrangement? Uh, try to listen to recordings of the artists and see what kind of accordion sound they like. Do they like something smooth and old fashioned or something edgy and punchy. More than anything else with jazz, you're expected to improvise and bring your own personality to the music. Unlike Broadway, it's expected to be different every time out. Jazz is a conversation and you're reacting to what the other musicians are doing in the moment. Preparation is really important, but with different priorities. You're getting used to the structures of the music so you can improvise and respond to the other musicians. You can practice soloing, you can practice comping, that is accompanying, and it's good to learn the melodies of the tunes even if you don't have to play them, depending of course on what the, the nature of the compositions is. Uh, in terms of materials, sometimes you get lead sheets, just melody and chords, or sometimes you get actual parts written for your instrument in an arrangement. Here's the accordion part for one of my own pieces arranged for a duo with trumpet. I wrote out the part for the right hand and then the chord symbols show the harmonic terrain for adding left hand and improvising. Over on page two, we just have chord symbols for the improvised solos at letter F. Then in the section after that, we improvise using rhythmic noise. And that's something that's understood that we went over in rehearsal. And I don't have to write it out. As you can see with all these differences, these four working situations have a few things in common. Preparation is always key. The role of the accordion isn't standardized, so you have to figure it out each time. Uh, rehearsal time is always limited, so you have to know the music well before you get to the rehearsal. Uh, the rehearsal is about polishing, it's about aesthetically improving the music and working on it. It's not about teaching the music to the musicians. And listening and blending with the other musicians is, of course, paramount in any situation. And last but not least, don't forget to have fun and enjoy the music. So thanks very much, Bill, for having me on board. If anyone has questions, you can always reach me through my website or on social media. Uh, good luck and enjoy your musical adventures. Thank you, Will. That was an incredible, incredible talk. Uh, chock full of information. Uh, notice how meticulous Will is. He found one mistake in the Hindemith Kammer Music number one which was written in 1929. Now, to my knowledge, no one else has found that mistake, uh, or else I would have known it. And those of us who have played in orchestras over the years, including major orchestras, no one ever brought out that mistake, but Will found it. So uh, uh, thank you for that, Will. <laughs> uh, the American Accordionist Association sponsors the seminars, and this is our 26th year. Um, Dr. Robert Young McMahon will give a talk about a lady in the organization back in 1950s, in the 50s, early 1950s, she got this idea that the accordion needed a specific repertoire unto itself. And she set out on a mission to track down as many composers as she could. And here to tell us about that is Dr. Robert Young McMahon. Bill has asked me to say a few remarks about the American Accordionist Association commissioned works. 
This is a very important part of the accordion world to me and one of the pioneering efforts to get more original works for accordion written. I think I reflect the feelings of at least a number of accordionists in what I'm about to express that led me to be very much an advocate for original new music for the accordion in the concert music area. I studied very seriously with Luca Paula from the age of 12 through college and in my post high school year around the age of 18 I was pretty advanced and I was playing some very uh, progressive um, and difficult works uh, including the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto, The Last Movement, and the Capriccio Brillant of Mendelssohn, the Scottish Fantasy of Brooke. All great works that sound wonderful on the accordion, some might even argue maybe better than the original setting. And they certainly were technique builders and they certainly taught us how to be very musical. But there was something basically missing and that was original music for the accordion particularly by important living composers. The saxophone was getting its share and other such recent instruments, but the accordion seemed to have a dearth of such original works. There were a few that were written specifically for the accordion, concertos by Pietro Diero and such, among the novelties and other light kind of music. But this was kind of post Rossini style, completely out of date for the mid 20th century. At some point I decided I was just going to give up the accordion and take up the piano. And indeed I did. I started studying piano when I was 18, got good enough in it in two years to get into Peabody with it. But I had announced to Lou at that time that I was going to quit the accordion and play an instrument that had its own repertoire. Uh, Lou very quickly dissuaded me of that and so I ended up then learning two instruments. I continued very much with accordion all the way through college and right on down to the present. It has always been with me, even during times when I could not get near it for a couple of years for other reasons. So I became then much more of an advocate of original music for accordion. I was very glad soon to find out that actually since I was about 12, since about 1957, a movement had been put underway under the auspices of a person of similar mind to mine, Elsie Bennett, our wonderful beloved Elsie Bennett, no longer with us. She was also discouraged by that notion and over many objections by the AAA board, she was finally voted the privilege of trying to find composers to write for the accordion. The AAA budget was quite large at that time because the accordion was very popular and so there was money to hire some of the best people around to write for it. Her son mentioned a piece he enjoyed very much by Paul Creston and Nelsie listened to it and she decided we'll see if we can track Paul down because Creston was a New Yorker like Elsie. And she did and they became fast friends and he wrote the first AAA commission work, Prelude and Dance for solo accordion, probably the most played and liked of all of the AAA commissions. And we're up to quite a high number of them by now. Following in this period of good AAA budgets and of reasonable priced famous composers, Elsie tracked down just about anybody who lived in the United States who had listened to her and came up with quite a list of impressive names to add to uh, what we see today in the AAA Festival uh, Journal and also on our website. So I'm just looking at a list here. Uh, the composers ranking uh, alphabetically that are famous, uh, Sam Adler, Robert Baxa, Robert Russell Bennett, who would not take money for is doing this work, Henry Brandt, uh, Henry Cowell, Paul Creston, David Diamond, Lucas Foss. So far, anybody out there who knows anything about American contemporary music in the 20th century should already be falling out of their chair, flabbergasted at these names that wrote for the accordion. Uh, Nicholas Flagello, um, considerably well known. And let's see, further down the list, um, we see George Kleinzinger. Yes, Tubby the Tuba, that's the guy. And uh, I think very impressive, uh, Ernst Krennic wrote two accordion pieces, one for the AAA and another for the ATG. 
So we have quite a list here. Um, also Virgil Thompson. This uh, went on mostly in the 1960s, a bit into the 70s. Unfortunately, as the accordion's popularity began to wane in America, so did the uh, AAA budget, and so less and less works could be commissioned. But sandwiched in between all of these famous names, even from the beginning, were some less known but impressive composers, some of whom were accordionists, including our own Bill Schimmel, and, well, for whatever reason, yours truly for a couple of pieces, and a few other uh, noteworthy accordionists. Uh, most, most recently, Guy Klusevic. So we have kept up a pretty good uh, rate of these going. In the beginning, uh, we were rather unique in you know, being able to tell people that some famous people had written for accordion or written something including accordion because some of the works were ensemble works that included accordion, which is every bit as important to the instrument's prestige as simply solo works. There were some concertos the Creston Concerto was really one of the standard works and one of the works he's best known for along with his saxophone concerto. So we should be very proud of this with the AAA and I think it had a lot to do with encouraging others to write with or without commissions and through other organizations as well. So today we have thousands of works for the accordion including chamber works by composers all over the world. Now, again, the AAA was not the only beginning source of this, but one of the significant ones. So we should be very grateful to uh, the AAA for allowing ALTSI to start this r ball rolling and getting this going. That makes me proud to be an accordionist, to know that I have my own classical repertoire. And I hope this is the feeling of others out there who are interested in playing classical music on the accordion and taking special pride and I think the feeling of necessity that they play works for the instrument, whether or not you like contemporary music. And when we say contemporary music, keep in mind the 20th century is a highly diverse century in all kinds of music, popular or classical. If you don't like one composer, you're possibly going to like another. So everybody, according to this out there, I urge you when you get to the level of technique that is possible, maybe through transcriptions of Romantic and Baroque pieces first, uh, you start pursuing music for the accordion or including the accordion in the original score. I think this is where it's at for the classical accordion. And indeed, there is such a thing as a classical accordion, and it's great. So, thank you very much. Goodbye now. Thank you, Bob. Robert Young McMahon. Uh, I'm very proud to be part of that distinguished group of composers as well. I really am. And uh, before we go on, I'd like to thank my producer, Rashid Elad Looney, and my artistic director, Mickey Goodman Schimmel. And now it's time. Uh, every year we have. Uh, a few people who play for us for criticism and comments. And uh, so we have a brave gentleman. Um, we're gonna hear something that he sent us, Psalm 89, and then we're going to give him some, again, constructive comments, opinions, or whatever you'd like to share. We'll now listen to Psalm 89, the gentleman is Jack D. Benedetto.
Jack Di Benedetto, uh, uh, any comments, any opinions, any uh, questions? You'll have to type them. Any comments? And as I said before, you'll have to type them in. Okay. Uh, who is the composer? Uh, I hear nice, rich sound, very nice energy. Um, any more? Okay, good, rich sound, nice energy. Uh, I agree, I agree. Uh, dynamic contrast missing, we'll get to that. We'll get to that, it's an interesting point. That was from Gene Pritzker. Um, any more comments? Well, um, Jack, uh, your heartfelt performance is, uh, is wonderful. I wouldn't change that for, uh, uh, for, for anything. Uh, you play it with a lot of heart. You play it with a lot of soul. Uh, now, one of the first things I would advise uh, to you would be uh, uh, do not perform in that chair. Choose a different chair to perform in. Uh, I would, you know, even, even a basic folding chair or a kitchen chair or the kind of chair you would see in an orchestral seating uh, with no arms. And I would, uh, and sit in the middle of the chair and with your, with your back straight but not stiff. And that way you get movement. You can move back when you need to, to interpret, you can, be, you can move forward, you can move to the side, in each side or around, and your interpretation and your sound can vary. And my second bit of advice, and Jean, uh, Jean brought it up, is that since you play the hymn many times, it, it would be uh, advisable to vary the dynamic contrast and even the texture. You may play one real smooth, or you, know, you might play the other one less smooth. Ya da da da, and then maybe da ba ba ba, ba 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 ba, and then combination ya da da da, ya ba ba ba. And uh, if you play in church, uh, you may notice that in some churches, oh. Uh, some churches uh, will sing all 16 verses of a hymn. And uh, so the organist has to figure out a way to make each, each, uh, each verse sound interesting. So uh, he may start so, uh, soft and then add the flute stops, add the eight foot stop, add the 16, and then at the end, come in full, full blown 32 foot stop, great stop at the end, which is like our master switch. So you may want to try that. Start with the violin stops and then put the organ stop on and eventually, you know, go full, you know, full force on the master, uh, on the master switch, creating a nice dynamic lead uh, build. And, uh, and so that's, that's my advice, uh, advice to you. As far as your heartfelt interpretation of it, I think it's wonderful. And thank you for sharing it. Absolutely, absolutely. If you can, uh, if you if you can find a way to change stops, uh, I know it's busy, and but we, you can uh, actually, Jack, you can actually get to the end of each chorus. Ya da da ya da ya. Chip. Ya da 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 ya da da da. Because even in church, they give the uh, they give the uh, congregation a chance to get their breath for the next, for the next chorus. And so you can think about that also, for 10 you're playing for a chorus. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's my advice. And thank you again for, uh, for, uh, for sharing. We're now gonna move on to uh, Bob McMahon again. And since he was talking about Luca Pola a great deal, he's gonna talk about uh, 
Lou, who has left us. He's one of our ancestors. And he's going to talk about a piece that he will play. But we're going to play the piece. We're going to program it in the concert later on. And I felt it belonged on the concert. But Bob will give the lead in to it uh, uh, right now. And here is, again, Dr. Robert Young McMahon, Bob McMahon. The piece I'm about to play is a short memorial to my dear friend and longtime mentor, a man responsible for practically anything in my life that has made me worthwhile, Lou Coppola. Many people remember him with great affection as a cheerful person, always full of mischief and humor, and a musician of impeccable technique and musicality. I owe him practically everything in my life, and I will miss him tremendously. Lou left us uh, at an, in a time of turmoil and upheaval in the world. Those of us in education had to learn all kinds of new techniques of teaching, complicated um, software programs and such to finish out our students' second half of the spring semester. This left me very little time to grieve for Lou at that time or to write a fitting memorial to his memory. The short little effort that I'm about to play uh, would be a temporary situation in that respect. And I, th I think it reflects my feelings more than anything. Later on, when I have more time, I hope to write a fast and cheerful piece uh, reflecting Lou's true personality and musicality. But for right now, Lou, this is for you. And thank you, I owe all to you. Thank you. And we'll hear that piece at the concert. Uh, Peter Jarvis is a composer and a percussionist. And he heads the contemporary music department at William Patterson University. And we've collaborated on many compositions. And we even released a new album, or will be released very, very, uh, very, very soon, of uh, percussion and accordion duets. And uh, I asked him to write me something uh, for the seminars, and because he's been doing it for many, many years already. And he asked, well, what, what would you like? Um, and I said, write something where the accordion player doesn't play any notes, where he simply treats it as a percussion instrument. And he said, well, do you have any model ideas that you would like me to uh, to model it after. And I mentioned, I said, well, there's a wonderful work by a composer named Morton Feldman, who was part of the John Cage circuit. And he wrote one of the world's softest pieces uh, called The King of Denmark, which is simply played very, 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 very softly on percussion, almost inaudible at times. And I said, could you write me something uh, for the accordion that will be soft and played percussively on the instrument with really no notes. Well, a few notes got in there. Uh, a few notes he added and a few, of course, I, by accident. Uh, but he wrote me a piece and I, and I said, he asked me, oh, uh, what would be a good title? And I said, call it the King of New York. And so Peter said to me, I'm not the King of New York. And I said, well, neither am I. Uh, but I still think it's a good title. It pays homage to Morton Feldman. And uh, so I'm going to perform it. And as you notice, as I perform it, you're going to hear other sounds uh, along with it that seem to be coming through my window. So ladies and gentlemen, the King of New York, written by Peter Jarvis and played by yours truly.
That's the King of New York. And since we're now uh, confined to our, to our individual spaces, homes, apartments, uh, it seemed fitting that when I performed this work and taped this work, uh, the windows happened to be opened. And it seemed that all the outside sounds wanted to join in. And I don't know how Mr. Feldman would have felt about that, but I don't think John Cage would have had a problem with that. And I will now play a work by a friend of mine, Elliot Sharp, who uh, was regarded, he's been around a long, long time as probably as long as, as me. And he, his, his, uh, he was regarded as a downtown legend. And uh, translated, that meant uh, a person on the downtown art scene, which was below 14th Street. And uh, now, of course, the art scene today is much more spread out. I don't think there's any, uh, I don't think there's such a thing as a quote a literal downtown scene. So uh, I would rather not call him a downtown legend. I would call him a legend. And uh, I had the uh, pleasure of uh, playing in one of his latest operas, Port Beau, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, Manhattan, as well as all over Germany. It was quite a, quite a hit in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, and he's written a number of graphic compositions, which means they are compositions which do not have notes written, but various graphic uh, designs. And if I could show that on the screen. And you will see various textures, various dimensions, various lines connecting them. And the name of the piece is Memory Amour. Now, one of the reasons why I like the piece so much, it reminded me of the accordion in constant permanent transition landing in particular places and then moving on, landing in another place, moving on, but never stopping in one place too long. And so it reminded me of the accordion in the realm of permanent transition. Now, in the words of Elliot Sharp, he says, memory amour, the player charts the path through a field of spears, each displaying a unique texture to be manifested in sound. So this is Memory Amour by Elliot Sharp.
Memory Amour by Elliot Sharp. And I will close the program with a short work by Dave Soldier. And it's conceptual work, which means just instructions are given. Part of a series of Lewitt etudes. And this is etude number 15. And the instructions basically tell us to play jailhouse rock in three different keys. <laughs> And that's the end of our master class. We're going to take five. We're going to come back in five minutes, talk amongst yourselves, and looking forward to a great concert. I'm Dr. William Schimmel. I, am I on? I don't know whether I'm on or not. Yes, Bill, you're on. You can start. Okay, we're on. And I'm going to show Elliot Sharp's composition, his graphic piece. I don't, I believe it didn't show the last time. So here's a look of what I was playing and interpreting. Memory Amour. And we're back. We're back with the concert and I'm Dr. William Schimmel. And uh, we're going to start our concert with the Bose Arts Tango. And uh, this is a work that was choreographed and danced by Mickey Goodman with music by, by uh, yours truly. And I'm basing it on the Ravel Quartet in F, which was written right after uh, the turn of the century, early 19, uh, early 20th. And uh, the, the contrast between the Beaux-Arts period and today is kind of a built-in ironic duality. Uh, especially in our confined nature now, as opposed to uh, what young Ravel experienced. So it was a wonderful time that Ravel experienced. He saw electric lights go on for the first time. Uh, he saw the wonderful wrought iron metro stops. Uh, he heard Rimsy Korsakov uh, Rimsy conduct. Uh, he uh, rode the first Paris metro uh, and uh, he attended Picasso's Blue Period. Uh, and so uh, that particular period was a very rich period. And the contrast that we're going to show you, the duality, is what the piece is all about. And the music is rather soft, uh, and uh, which is very, very appropriate because it's, uh, the music is in the performer's mind and psyche and heart. So here is the Beaux-Arts Tango.
Mozart's tango and uh, danced and choreographed by Mickey Goodman and music by yours truly. Every sound is part of the score. And, uh, and all of the aspects that work together, the music in the performer's mind, the sounds all add to the tenderness of the performance. And now, since we've been talking about soft music, we're moving from soft to murmur. And uh, Will Holzhauser wrote a piece for four accordions, and he's going to play them all himself. And so let's listen to Murmur, um, composed and performed by Will Holzhauser. Thank you. 
Holzhauser performing his own composition, Murmur, for four accordions, each part played by the composer performer. Um, very effective piece, Will, really terrific. And uh, John Foti is up next. And perhaps some of you out there may have uh, heard him play with a gentleman named uh, Dan Zanes. And he had a group that was primarily uh, performing for children. Uh, he was formerly with the Del Fuegos and started a, a children's group and ended up on Sesame Street. Well, John was the uh, accordion player. And uh, what John has now done is he's taken a work by Sun Ra. I'm sure some of you out there know who Sun Ra is. And he took it and he did a wonderful video on Sun Ra's piece, Interplanetary Music. And uh, again, since he's confined to where he is, well, it's Cape May, with nice place to, if you're going to be in any kind of confinement or any kind of uh, uh, place like that, Cape May, Cape May seems to be a pretty nice, uh, nice place to be. Uh, I've always had a wonderful time there. Uh, he uh, did a wonderful video where he plays many different instruments and some of them are household. And if you look around you, uh, you might see some members of his family joining in. So this is uh, John Foti and interplanetary music. Interplanetary music 
and that's uh, John Foti, and the piece is by Sun Ra. Uh, John, nice to get the family involved, it really is. And uh, now I'd like to introduce the next piece, which almost got introduced. <laughs> and, uh, and that's uh, a piece by Lee McClure, and Lee's been a veteran of the seminars uh, for, for years. And since we started, uh, this is our, as I say, our 26th year. Uh, and uh, Lee is an electric flutist, a uh, composer. And a number of years ago, he founded a group called Eclectics. And the name Eclectic was kind of a naughty word years ago. Uh, I mean, when he founded the word eclectics, uh, uh, composers uh, were usually in one camp or another, still back then. And so uh, if you were eclectic, you were kind of all over the place and uh, you didn't get a genre that you, that you, that you stuck to. Uh, you know, whether you were the minimalist, whether you were the maximist, whether you were the uh, 12 tone and so forth. And uh, now eclectic is the norm. Uh, and uh, Lee was on to it before a lot of people. And uh, he's still as eclectic as ever. And I hope he will stay that way. And uh, the piece he wrote, a wonderful piece, and it's called For Paul, dedicated to the memory of uh, Paul Nash, the great jazz artist. And uh, this is for eclectic, this is for electric flute and accordion with Lee McClure playing and uh, me on accordion. This is for Paul, Lee McClure. <laughs> Thank you. 
love the electric flute. Oh. Uh, and uh, the accordion player seems to be wearing the same jacket as me uh, today. And uh, uh, again, a tremendous eclectic uh, piece, um, a touch of tango, a touch of jazz. And uh, I mean, I actually, I heard a touch of Hotel California in there. Uh, I won't tell anybody. Oh, I just told you. Uh, one thing about the uh, Hotel of California, you can check out. Uh, but you can't leave, and uh, I'll leave you. I'll leave you with that. Uh, we're now going to hear uh, Robert Young McMahon, and he will now play his piece for Lou Mc, uh, uh, for you know Lou Coppola. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob McMahon. Dr. Robert Young McMahon and his piece for Lou. Again, Lou Coppola was one of our great accordion ancestors. And uh, we like to always honor uh, our ancestors 
uh, sometimes we, you know, in many cases, not all, but in many cases, we write compositions in their honor or uh, have, have dinners in their honor, uh, but we always, we always honor them. And uh, we'll honor Daniel Desiderio on, uh, on, uh, on Sunday. And he's another one of our accordion ancestors. And um, I think each year we try and cover at least one or two, one or two people. Uh, Denise Kincelik, uh is a uh, quadruple uh, threat in the, uh, in the New York music scene or the Brooklyn music scene and Manhattan music scene. As, uh, she came to New York uh, a number of years ago uh, as a flutist, as a pianist, as a composer, as an arranger, and uh, she got hooked on the accordion. And uh, she's, uh, she's the musical director of the Main Squeeze the Accordion Orchestra. And um, she uh, arranges music for the New York Flute Club, which uh, are some of the major flute players uh, in the city, including the New York Philharmonic. Um, she has appeared with me in a number of occasions. And uh, I'd like to introduce you to Denise Kincelik, and um, she's going to tell you about what she's been up to in terms of her composing. Denise Kincelik. Margaret Atwood is probably best known as the author of The Handmaiden's Tale. She wrote a series of poems entitled Songs of the Transformed. I have written a song cycle encompassing these poems, and it includes pieces from the perspective of the respective animals. There's one of the song of the worms, the pig song, this one is the Fox Fire Song, written from the perspective of the fox on the hunt. This happens to be a Brooklyn fox. <laughs> Accurate mafia eyes and dog sidekicks. I'm tired of you. The chase is no longer fun. The dispute for this territory of fences and hidden cabins will never be won. Let's leave each other alone. I saw you as another guy. I could play with in this maze of leaves and lovely blood. Performing hieroglyphs for you with my teeth and agile feet. And dead hens, harmless and jolly as corpses, as in a detective story. But you, you were serious. You wore gloves and plotted. You saw me as Raymond, a crook in a fur visor. The fate you aimed at me was not light literature. Oh, you misunderstand. This game is not a law. This dance is not a whim. This kill is not a rival. I crackle through your pastures. I make no profit. Like the sun, I burn and burn. This tongue licks through your body. Also. Only through the accordion can you get uh, Betty Boop meets Lawrence Welk meets Margaret Atwood. Uh, what a combination. Uh, I forgot to mention, uh, she's also a vocalist. So uh, 
we'll be hearing more of her Margaret Atwood songs uh, later on uh, this week as well. I'm now going to turn uh, to Jean Pritzker and I'm going to play something live. Uh, I asked him to write a piece for, for me. And uh, when you ask Jean to write a piece for you, uh, it shows up uh, pretty quickly. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, somehow some carrier pigeon just uh, carries a piece into the window. Uh, when, I, when I asked, you know, Jean, can you write me a piece? There it is. Uh, and uh, he's a very important uh, composer on the, uh, uh, you know, the, I would say the modern composer scene with, uh, with a touch of hip hop and a touch of other aspects to come out of a more eclectic nature. And so he combines a lot of things. That's basically what I'm saying. Uh, he's the head of Composers Concordance, a group that goes way back and that I kind of feel that I was influential in even starting. And now he's a musical director of it. And uh, I like to play his piece, The Year of Goodbye. I hope it isn't the year of goodbye, but nonetheless, I will play it. And here is Jean Pritzker's piece, The Year of Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, 
The Year of Goodbye by June Pritzker. And what I'm going to play now before we get to uh, the last piece, The Exquisite Corpse by uh, Benjamin Ickes, I'm going to play one more piece. And this piece is written by David First. And who's David First? Well, Read a full page article about him in the New York Times this week and talking about his new 3D set of a new piece. And the piece is called The Consummation of Right and Wrong. David and I go way back, we go back to the 70s. And uh, David had a group a number of years ago back think back that far called the Note Killers, um, an indie band. And apparently uh, it was a band that influenced greatly Sonic Youth. And apparently they admitted that. So uh, he planted the seed in uh, not only Sonic Youth, but I'm sure many other indie rock bands. And he's interested in drones. Uh, and he was kind enough to do an accordion arrangement for me of a section of the consummation of right and wrong. And I will now play that combination, that arrangement that he put together for me. The consummation of right and wrong.
Scene Two from the Consummation of Right and Wrong by David First in an arrangement that he made specifically for me. And thank you, David. And our final piece will be Exquisite Corpse by Benjamin Hickey's. Hi, I'm Benjamin Ickes. Thanks for joining us at uh, the Master Concert Series. What I'm going to be playing is an exquisite corpse. So if you're not familiar with what an exquisite corpse is, it's an art game that was made famous by the surrealists, such as Dolly, where one person would draw a head of an animal, and then the next person would draw the torso, only referencing the head and then the third person will draw the legs, only referencing the torso. So we're doing this musical application of it where I've written four bars of music, and then I passed it off to someone to write the next four bars, and then passed their four bars off to the next person who only saw the previous four bars, and so on. And so what we have here is a work in progress that is made by composers myself and then Clyde Daly, and then Rick Becker, uh, then Rebecca Schlappick, and then Raja Azar, and then Mary Gatchel, and then Lisa Despino. And I've been doing all four voices on the accordion, and you will hear me play the soprano line on the recording, everything else being previously multi-tracked. Thanks. Thank you, Benjamin. And by the way, uh, we should all congratulate him. He uh, just became a uh, Harvard graduate. And uh, before we wrap up, I, uh, he was talking about Salvador Dali. And uh, there was a time back in the 1970s where I was introduced to Salvador Dali by Ultraviolet. and. Uh, and he uh, shook my hand and said, uh, uh, Impression it was an exhibit of a, a painting of his, a new one, at the Guggenheim. It was a private thing. And uh, I said something very, 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 uh, oh, I love your work, Mr. Dolly, and so forth. And he said, ah, he said, Dolly in love with Dolly. And uh, so uh, I, had that, I had that experience. And then afterwards, we all went out for hamburgers and asparagus because we were told that after you see Salvador Dali, 
you go out and you have hamburgers and asparagus. It was, it was uh, mandatory. <laughs> so uh, this brings the end of our first master class in concert of our 26 years of accordion seminars. Um, you may talk amongst yourselves for a while and you can chat with me, I believe. You can, uh, you know, through, uh, through the keyboard or whatever, uh, or I can have my webmaster turn the sound on. We'll figure that out. But nonetheless, I'm here. And uh, I, uh, I thank you for, uh, for being here and I will see you tomorrow. And uh, thank you, I'm Dr. William Schimmel.